Yeah, so thank you very much for that introduction. And yeah, I'm excited to be able to be here today to talk to you about uh, the work that we've been doing at the Institute for the Study of Ancient Cultures, West Asia and North Africa, and in my specific uh, position as the manager of the Continuing Education Program. And really what I wanted to discuss today was the teacher workshops and uh, the adult education class that we've been doing between the spring of 2021 and uh, the summer of 2023, so this year, um, on looking at uh, Black female uh, artists, intellectuals, and historians, and how they've engaged uh, with uh, Nubia as well as Egypt. So I'll be talking about uh, two teacher workshops, uh, looking at uh, the first one, looking at Pauline Hopkins, made of Warwick Fuller, and Drusilla Dungey Houston, as well as I did a separate PowerPoint on Edmonia Lewis, and then uh, a uh, teacher workshop from uh, the winter of 2022 on Edmonia Lewis, and then the adult education class uh, that was in June of this year on Drusilla Dungey Houston's uh, history. And I should note that the teacher workshops are open to everyone, so not just teachers. Um, and that's something that we say because I want to have, you know, a lot of different people come who might be interested uh, in this topic. Right. So to start first with the teacher workshops. Uh, so since the fall of 2020, um, I've been doing teacher workshops, uh, sometimes with other uh, people such as uh, Catherine Hodge, who you just heard from, um, looking at uh, different topics in uh, sort of the ancient world. Although, as you can see from the list, uh, primarily Nubia and Egypt has been the main sort of focus. Uh, so we've been doing quite a lot of them. And these are inspired by something that's called Project Archaeology, which is a, a organization that's set up uh, to look to sort of look at archaeology and sort of education in archaeology. And they have free lesson plans, which I downloaded and adapted uh, for these uh, different uh, different workshops. So basically the uh, format of the teacher workshop was to distribute a lesson plan in PDF prior to the beginning of the workshop so people could see what it was that we were going to be talking about. Um, and then each teacher workshop was an hour session online over Zoom. Um, and on the Zoom, basically we had a sort of three main parts. Uh, the first was a PowerPoint providing information on how to access ISAC resources on the subject. So both the museum itself, as well as archival resources. So how to use our search the collection database to find information on this. Then we would go through the lesson plan using a Google Jamboard, which we'll look at some uh, screenshots shortly, as well as then after that, at the end, a separate PowerPoint that sort of would discuss the themes and methodologies of the teacher workshop, but look at something else. So to give you an idea of some of the things that were in the PowerPoint, um, as you can see here, so this is from the first of the workshops looking at uh, Pauline Hopkins, made of a work for and Drusilla Dungey Houston. Uh, you can see it says it's inspired and adapted by Project Archaeology lesson plans, and then basically taking people through, uh, you know, sort of background information so that they sort of understood where the lesson plan was coming from. And then within the lesson plan itself, going through sort of questions that, you know, people could ask their students or ask people who are coming to museums or just to think about for themselves um, and sort of things that they could learn about it. And this is from the Edmonia Lewis uh, lesson plan. So each of these, and you'll see this is from when we were still the Oriental Institute, since we only changed our name in April. Um, Basically, these would take people through, you know, trying to access uh, the ISAC resources. Now, the difficulty with this, of course, was that, uh, you know, these are not resources that tend to be available on our database, unlike some of the other lesson plans. Uh, so I would do things, for example, looking when we we're looking at Edmonia Lewis's uh, death of Cleopatra, looking for online resources on Cleo on different Cleopatras who were happened to be represented in the database. So we did sort of have to more sort of in some ways talk about subjects rather than these specific individuals since they weren't actually represented in the database. And so then the Jamboard would take people through the main points of the lesson plans. So you can see here looking at, you know, how do we use, uh, you know, primary and secondary resources to see how people have understood Nubia and why were their views marginalized and ignored. So very much trying to explain to people why are these people that when we study the historiography of Nubia in Egypt, we often don't find them in uh, resources that we might have. And so in the Jamboard, one of the things that I would do, do and sort of sometimes depends on time, um, but when there is time, invite people to provide feedback. So you can see that here with these sticky notes uh, that basically talking to people about, for example, what do you see in this photograph? 
Um, this is uh, Frederick Douglass's uh, son's wife. So it's Frederick Douglass's daughter-in-law. Um, so, you know, what does that say? You know, how do you find out about her? And so you can see these different sort of suggestions that people had about how to do that. So very much trying to interact with people and sort of get them engaged with sort of thinking about these kinds of questions, how we understand primary sources, these kinds of issues. Um, and for example, with Edmonia Lewis's Death of Cleopatra statue, which you can see here, talking to them about, you know, what do they see when they see the statue? And you can see the various uh, comments on what people thought on this. And then, you know, engaging them with some of the primary sources. So for example, Pauline Hopkins from her a novel of One Blood, which is one of the earliest Afrofuturist novels that we know of uh, from the early 20th century, talking to people about, you know, what is she saying and having them think about this, right? And then in the end, reflecting on new knowledge, you know, why should we study these individuals? Why are they important? Why has this been ignored in the past? Um, and, you know, how can we better use these sources to understand how people have studied and been inspired by the history of Nubia, specifically looking at Black female artists and intellectuals and historians? Um, and in the case of Edmonia Lewis's Death of Cleopatra, thinking about how does this communicate? Why is this statue important? And then, you know, suggesting, you know, possible exercises students could think about the statue and present to the class, explaining what it meant to them, sort of things like this to really, as I say, engage with the material and ask questions about it. And then we turn to the PowerPoints. So this is sort of using these methodologies and looking at other um, topics. So in this case, this is from the uh, the, the lesson plan on uh, Pauline Hopkins made of a work for and Drusilla Dungy Houston, looking at how we see someone from a different generation because they were doing things at the beginning of the 20th century. Edmonia Lewis, is, who's in the 19th century and is looking at Egypt, how she had engaged with the statue and death of Cleopatra. And this was really inspired then the subsequent teacher workshop that concentrated only on her, right? So presenting things like, for example, the reaction to the statue. And then with Edmonia Lewis doing a PowerPoint on the artist Fred Wilson and his um, exhibition Wildfire Test Pit, which was inspired by the work of Edmonia Lewis at uh, Oberlin uh, College, where she went to school and looking at the work that he did and why. Now, turning to the adult education program, then the idea was to offer a free class on Drusilla Dungy Houston's history. So again, taking what we've sort of been doing in the teacher workshop and other uh, things that we'll talk about later, uh, and uh, deciding to do an entire two-hour class on that. And this was the is the third of free classes that we've offered at that I've offered at the ISAC that I've done. Uh, the first one in 2021, looking at trade across ancient and medieval North Africa, where I actually did cooking online and managed to set my recipe on fire. So that was that was exciting. Uh, and then uh, the Grima Gospels, uh, late antique manuscripts from Ethiopia, from January of 2023, which is by far the biggest class that we've had and the biggest reaction that we've had as far as people signing up. Uh, over 250 people signed up for that. And then Drusilla Dungy Houston's uh, history. And really the purpose of this was to look at Drusilla Dungy Houston, why she was important, her historical context, her family, uh, the sources that she used to write, the wonderful Ethiopians of the ancient Kushite empire, her other writings and the publication history, as well as the reception and the unpublished volume two, which came out a few years ago. Um, so I took people through the online class that we put together, which is on Canvas, which is the University of Chicago's online uh, learning platform. Um, and so you can see that here. So this is the front uh, page with Drusilla Dungy Houston and her book, which is actually very rare and hard to find in the original edition. Uh, which led people to think it hadn't been published and widely distributed very much, but actually uh, it appears that that is not the case and a lot more people read it at the time than uh, initially people thought. Uh, and then there was a course syllabus, which you can see uh, the hyperlinks. Um, this one wasn't live yet at the time, um, but the hyperlinks to the different um, her work as well as secondary literature uh, on her, her family and other uh, and other articles which were relevant uh, to really give people resources that they could use to explore Drusilla Dungy Houston uh, more. Uh, and then really talking about her in the context of black intellectual history on Egypt and Nubia. Um, so you can see an example of uh, some of the uh, sources that we're looking at in order to try and explain, you know, 
where where is this history coming out of in terms of the development of you know people and their ideas about history um, at the time? And then also talking about the ways in which people have been engaging with, for example, modern Egyptology, as you can see, uh, Perry's criticisms of uh, Egyptologists um, here. And then uh, from her newspaper articles, so her brother ran the Black Dispatch in Oklahoma City. Um, and so she wrote a lot of articles for that um, and her advising on the fact that she was about to publish this uh, history and sort of the way in which she presented it. Because we are very fortunate that we have quite a bit of information on that so we can reconstruct this quite well. So we sort of have ideas about, you know, what it was she was trying to do uh, with the writing of her history. And then I took people through the, uh, through the book itself so we can see the table of contents um, here. Uh, and so this is volume one. She had a variety of volumes that she was going to publish, uh, but this is the only volume that was published while she was still alive. Um, and then here, her purpose of publishing the book. So she lays out very clearly what it is she's trying to do, um, which is, you know, very uh, helpful. And then uh, focusing on things which I think aren't particularly of interest, at least to myself. Uh, so for example, her... Um, her what she wrote about Candace uh, uh, in uh, in in Nubia um, and sort of talking about the way in which she said this, as well as her criticisms of George Reisner um, and the fact that she clearly you know was you know looking at what it was he was writing and you know her responses to him. Also, I think I, some of you may know this. I presented on the, some of this as well in uh, RC uh, two years ago uh, in the virtual RC. And then um, talking about her different sources, so all the different sources she used, which as you see is quite a few, um, and some of them are quite interesting. Obviously, even though she didn't like Reisner's ideas, obviously she did engage with him um, as well as Breasted and use them as uh, sources, as well as you know extensive classical authors and various historians from Europe as, um, and Egyptologists as well in order to put together this uh, history. And then also what we have is her attempts to get recognition for this work and to get it publicized in the Black uh, community. And so we have a number of letters between her and W.E.B. Du Bois, um, who was, well, she explains why she wrote this history, how, um, but also W.E.B. Du Bois is, was not that supportive and was rather dismissive of the work. And, you know, we have a letter where he recommends she you know, go to school more um, and these kinds of things, um, but also to sort of walk people through that, uh, sort of how that worked and why, you know, the history itself was sort of received in the way that it was. And then why after its initial success, it seems to have sort of fallen out of attention of people. And then it's only was recently more in the 1980s that there started to be more interest in this book. And then sort of explaining that, you know, it's a very important work, but obviously, um, as uh, Deborah Hurd points out in her 2022 article, you know, it has a certain, you know, relied heavily on Greek sources, for example. So, so obviously, you know, it's not perfect, but the idea is that it has a lot of important ideas about in it. And it's also very important for our study of, uh, you know, sort of the development of intellectual history and the historiography of Nubia. Right. So in addition then, it was important for me to not only talk about this in terms of you know, giving classes and giving teacher workshops, but also in other contexts in the Institute for the Study of Ancient Cultures. Uh, so for example, in my Nubian Queens class, we talked about some of these things. So I did a class on that uh, a number of years ago. Um, and then also in uh, the Queens and Princesses in the Ancient World class, which I did as well, uh, I think that's probably about a year and a half ago, uh, I talked about some of the, their, the work of, of Drusilla Dungey Houston, for example, in that class. And then Brian Muse and I did an article for uh, News and Notes where we looked at uh, Made of O work fuller. And then finally, in the tours that I do. So I do tours of the uh, of the uh, ISAC Museum, the most popular of which is the post-colonial tour. That's one I give to University of Chicago, primarily undergraduates, but graduate students as well, uh, where I talk about Drusilla Dungey Houston and her work. Um, and then also in the Queens and Princesses tour, I have a Nubia tour, as well as uh, I did once an Afrofuturism and literature tour where I talked about 
Pauline Hopkins. So really what I wanted to talk to you about today was sort of sort of what we've been doing, how it's been applied from teacher workshops and classes as well to, to you know, ultimately to tours and other ways to engage with the public to give them a better appreciation of and a familiar with uh, Black female historians and intellectuals like Drusilla Dungey Houston, Pauline Hopkins, Maida Wilbert Fuller, and Edmonia Lewis. So if any of you are interested in the lesson plans, uh, please feel free to contact me. I'm more than happy to send those. Or if you want access to the Drusilla Dungey Houston class or anything uh, like that, just you can email me here. So thank you all very much for the opportunity to talk about what I really feel is an important and exciting topic to engage with with the public. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vorderstrauss. I just want to say I have been in several of your workshops and events, and it really is critical information that by and large we are not getting in a more traditional educational context. So for you to do that work and also to have the platform of a place like ISAC to be able to do that is really just amazing and everyone should take advantage of these opportunities when you're yeah. able to. Thank you, because I remember when I took, you know, Egyptology classes and we would talk about the history of Egyptology and none of these individuals, you know, would ever come into it. We never even studied Nubia as a student. Like it was kind of mentioned as that thing that, you know, got gets conquered by Egypt on occasion, right? But there was never any, you know, so again, you know, yeah, I'm I'm very fortunate that I have the opportunity to do that and to promote these things and, you know, be able to, you know, try to sort of be like, look, there there were other voices, there were other people, and here's who they were and what they did and why we should care now. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, are there any questions? Please put them in the Q&A. Um, while we're waiting, I have an additional question, um, not, not a comment, but a question this time. So do you have any, any sense of what, what the most surprising or interesting or compelling thing you found doing your research that was that you had not been formally introduced to? Yeah, I think the most interesting thing for me was the realization, and this was coming from reading articles by people like Vanessa Davies, when I realized that there was actually this whole really long intellectual history of Black historians, intellectuals, and artists going back, you know, to indeed the 1820s. Um, actually, Vanessa came and gave an RC talk where she talked about Pauline Hopkins and also W.E.B. Du Bois interacting with Petrie. And she was mentioning somebody from 1828, Daniel Walker. And I was just really surprised with that. And then I started doing more work and realized, you know, and, and I'm still doing it. Like there's still a lot that I don't know about, right? Just because this is not material, which as I say, has gotten into sort of the main, main sort of discourse about historiography. So that to me was the most surprising thing was not so much that there were people who had, who had suggested this, but that there was actually this huge, long intellectual tradition that was going along quite, quite well throughout the 19th into, you know, and into the, you know, into the 20th century, right. And continuing through the 20th century that was active. So that, that to me was super interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, we have a question here in the Q&A. So relating back to Dr. Babcock's talk about how the new students are not seeing Egyptology as a career choice and how higher education is eliminating Near Eastern studies. Um, how do you see these online continuing ed classes helping to keep the field alive? Great question. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things we noticed with the pandemic, we had been doing hybrid before that. So in person and online, but then obviously went all online and for the classes. And one of the things I noticed was the huge uptick in engagement that we actually had. So a lot of people actually had had didn't see that, but we were very fortunate and had a lot of people sort of, you know, come and uh, come and do that. Um, and I think actually we've had a couple of people who've emailed and said, look, you know, I actually decided to go into Egyptology. So one of the people who took my Queens and Princesses class, who's now currently in Boy Scouts hieratic class, as well as in the Back to Babylonia um, curriculum, they um, class, they actually said, I'm now doing Egyptology and it's because I took these classes, which is oh. very gratifying. <laughs> yes. Uh, 
so there there does seem to be people do seem to be people who are they're curious right mm -hmm. and they're not sure you know is this something really for them or not and it does seem at least you know that's obviously anecdotal right but nevertheless you know it does look like there are people who who want to do this and also i think a lot of people who may not have necessarily had the opportunity to pursue formal egyptological or nubiological training when you know they were in school who are like want to do this now as um you know as you know sort of more you know older students right coming back to this so we also i think are able to foster sort of interests in um you know that you know so it's not just for people you know it's not just necessarily people who want to go into the field but also people who want to you know form right where they teach right but people want to go into the field in a different way right mm -hmm. so so sort of see both things i think yeah well that's wonderful uh, well i think that's the end of our questions so i just wanted to thank dr borderstrauss again for that wonderful presentation and um at the end here, we just have a few final closing comments from me, and then we will conclude Mo Egypt 5. Um, so, over the course of the day, you have heard presentations on a variety of topics from a diverse group of presenters. The common thread has been how we as educators, as students, as interested amateurs can improve, innovate, collaborate, and and reform the teaching of ancient Egyptian and Nubian topics for today's learners. I hope you have all learned something new and discovered topics you'd like to explore more in depth. I also hope that the presenters have sparked an interest in you to keep this conversation going after today. Thank you for spending your Saturday with us and we hope to see you in the future at the sixth annual Missouri Egyptological Symposium or another RC Missouri event. I would like to thank again, Dr. Kathleen Shepard for running our Zoom rooms uh, for Dr. Sarah Skellinger for chairing sessions and for everyone who has participated, um, such as the Symposium and Fundraising Committee for reviewing applications for abstracts. Uh, I'll conclude with an ancient Egyptian phrase that is familiar to many of us, Ankh Wajah Seneb, life, prosperity, and health. Thank you.